The Turks and Caicos Islands archipelago is comprised of 40 islands and keys, of which eight are inhabited. Each island possesses a distinct Caribbean charm that offers a unique cultural experience. From Providenciales with its luxurious tourism product, to the tranquil retreats of North and Middle Caicos, to the bustling islet of Grand Turk, our nation's capital. Savvy travelers in search of an opulent vacation spot have slowly explored the true beauty of the Turks and Caicos Islands, which has catapulted our islands to favorite destination status by the rich and famous. Luxurious resorts, majestic spas, world-class restaurants offering Epicurean cuisine, and pristine beaches conspire to create an unparalleled Caribbean experience. So whether you are on land or under the water, you will relax in the uncompromising serenity, hospitality, and splendor of our islands. Hi, my name is O'Brien Forbes. The Turks and Caicos Islands is certainly a great place to live and to call home. As a Turks and Caicos Islander, I've always wanted to take an ancestral journey to learn exactly where the peoples of these islands came from. So I thought to start with the author of this fascinating book, The History of the Turks and Caicos Islands, by Dr. Carlton Mills. Let's go. Um, the, there is a chapter in the book on, um, on that basically, uh, trying to, uh, to um, point out where we actually originated from, but there are a number of schools of thought. Some people are saying that um, it was a result of, um, well, we know obviously from some research that um, the Amerindians were the first to have made landfall in the TCI, but they have been decimated as a result of this, the cruelty exhibited by the Spaniards. It's probably debatable that as a result of the troubadour sinking off East Caicos that helped to populate the Turks and Caicos Islands. It's also believed that when the Bermudans came here to Rexall, they brought black slaves from Africa with them out of Bermuda. That's another theory and also another theory has to do with in, when the United States gained independence in 1776 when the loyalists were chased out of the United States they were given land in the TCI by the British government at the time to settle the Turks and Caicos, and when that happened, they also brought their slaves with them. The, the Troubadour was actually a, a slave ship that left Spain en route to Cuba. As you probably aware, Cuba at the time was a colony of Spain. This was about 1842. Slavery was abolished in the Caribbean, and in, in, in the British Caribbean, in 1834, and then there was a period of um, apprenticeship uh, where the, the slaves were, according to the British, uh, uh, were being allowed to be able to um, become men and women and become industrious. Okay, so when that incident happened, um, the, the, the wreckage took place in 1842 off East Caicos. The story of the troubadour came to light in 1993 when Miss Greeth Siam, a Norwegian benefactor of the proposed National Museum, made a chance discovery. In her collaboration with Dr. Donald Keith, who had earlier successfully excavated another wooden shipwreck in the islands, Miss Siam found a letter in the Museum of Natural History in New York. The letter penned by an art dealer in 1878 described two African artifacts found on board a schooner, the Esperanza, the last legal Spanish slave ship. Dr. Donald Keith, chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Turks and Caicos National Museum, worked tirelessly for years with his team to bring TCI history to life. He inadvertently learned about the letter, and it has excited him to this day. It all started I'm 15 years ago at least, when the uh, lady who founded this museum, Mrs. Greta Sane, and I went up to the Smithsonian in Washington, and the reason was to look for artifacts, Indian artifacts, Lucayan Indian artifacts that we knew had been sold to the Smithsonian uh, more than 100 years ago. We had letters to that effect. 
And they were very gracious at the museum and let us uh, see all the Indian artifacts. And in the, in the process, they showed us a, an inventory, a list of all the things that a man who lived here on Grand Turk, a collector, way back in the 1800s, had offered to the museum, to the Smithsonian, for sale. The Smithsonian bought some of them, but not all of them. And way back toward the end of this list, uh, it, there was an item that said, um, two African idols from the last slave ship to wreck in the Caicos Islands. And it went on to elaborate a little bit. There was a whole paragraph there. And uh, we, as soon as we saw that, we thought, whoa, this is important uh, for the history of the islands. Mainly because the last part of that paragraph said that all the people were taken off the slave ship to Grand Turk and this guy lived on Grand Turk, who was writing the letter, and he said, where they now form the pith of our laboring population. And what that said to us was, uh, they settled in the islands, they didn't go somewhere else, so they weren't sent somewhere else, or taken somewhere else, which was the normal process. And uh, so it's, it's like, wow, uh, here's the story of a ship that brought the ancestors of a lot of people who live here today to these islands. This is a great story. I'd never heard that before. None of us had. Now, all we know about Troubadour is the description they gave us, which is it was a vessel of 111 tons burden. That doesn't really tell you all that much by itself. And it was a brigantine. Once rescued, the survivors were taken to Grand Turk, where the ship's crew was imprisoned in the upper room of the courthouse. And the Africans were placed here in the crowded prison. However, a better long-term solution was required. Should the Africans be returned to Africa? Should they be sent to Nassau, Bahamas, where the authorities would deal with them? Or should they be released into the local communities? The last option was preferred, but the authorities needed to recover their cost of rescuing the Africans. They also needed support for the Sauls proprietors, so a compromise was reached. In the Turks Islands, the only work available was salt production, and while working conditions were much improved since the abolition of slavery, salt raking was an unpleasant, laborsome task with few rewards, not the preferred job of locals. Salt proprietors were eager to take in the liberated Africans as cheap labor to boost production and profitability. One of the peculiarities of British rule in the island was the British subjects living on the salt islands had an equal share in the salt ponds. It would appear likely that the arrival of so many new residents would have been unpopular with the proprietors of the Salinas, because as freedmen, the Africans would have been given a share of the pond once the year's labor was done. Hence, it seems more than a coincidence that the foundation of the settlement of Bambara on Middle Caicos dates from 1842, the year after the Africans would have been released from the labors on Grand Turk. Sending the Africans off to virtually uninhabited middle Caicos would have been a good way of relieving the salt producers from their obligations to the new citizens. You know, the name Bambara, here spelled with two R's, exists in Africa, in what is now the country of Mali. Uh, there's a town spelled that way only with one R, and it's a language family, it's, it's a culture, and I don't mean a small one. I think there are several million people who speak that language and live in that region. Uh, and it just seems too coincidental, doesn't it, for the two slave ships bringing people directly from Africa over here and wrecking very near there. And even though they may have spent some time in, in the Turks and Caicos, in the case of the Troubadour, or, or just arrived directly in the case of the people from Esperanza, um, they uh, would perhaps, remembering where they came from, use that name. We know that the ship wrecked here. We know that there were 190 or plus uh, slaves. We know that 24 of them went to the Bahamas. We know that uh, at the end of a year of apprenticeship, there was 163 slaves who actually were given the choice to, uh, to move to Little Caicos. And so um, the assumption is those slaves, uh, most likely the majority of them came from their home, their ancestral home in Africa, in the Bambara area of Mali. West Africa. So the assumption is that uh, they named the town, they were their township, after their home. I don't think that the name was a random name. It had a connection. And so 
uh, someone must have come from there or it was based on a memory of, of a place. Military man who was uh, describing the, the uh, Esperanza event said that some of the people, the Africans, uh, he thought uh, were still in the bush and couldn't be found. They, they came to haul over plantation, that's where everybody gathered, but some uh, may have stayed in, 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 on Middle Caicos. And uh, it's a possibility that those were the founders of Bambara. It's also a possibility that the uh, Troubadour people founded Bambara, because although they uh, came to, were all brought to Grand Turk and freed, uh, there's a they were people from an agricultural um, culture, and this was all about salt over here, you know, industrial. And uh, it's not too much of a stretch to imagine that they would have, uh, they would already have seen the Caicos Islands and would have wanted to go there to set up uh, their own village and uh, to, to uh, farm. So uh, the suspicion is that Bambara, because of its name, is somehow or other tied to either the Esperanza people, the Troubadour people, or, or both. But in both cases, we're talking people directly from Africa coming here with all their language, their culture, uh, their stories, everything. And for us, that's real important because the, the Africans who came with the loyalists from the U.S. Uh, may have been second, third, I don't know what, generation born in on this side of the Atlantic. And so a lot of their culture would have been uh, lost, probably. Uh, but the ones coming from Africa, they would all be fresh, and uh, that, that's what makes it special. I believe that the more research we do into this, the more we're gonna find uh, that not all the slaves went to Grand Turk. Not all the slaves went to, or were sheared between Grand Turk and the Bahamas. The fact of the matter is that because of the close geographical distance between um, uh, Middle Caicos and East Caicos, I'm, I'll, I'm sure research will show in years to come that slaves from that shipwreck did go to Middle Caicos. This circumstantial evidence makes for a very good argument. Local folklore contends that Bambara has two origins. The first being that Bambara was settled by Africans from Hallover Plantation, once owned by William Forbes. This would account for why the name Forbes is so commonplace. The second being that Africans from a wrecked slaver eventually settled here. While both stories have some basis in truth, proof is still being sought. However, the most important step will be to look for any remains of the troubadour. This archaeological search and hopefully recovery of any remains will provide a tangible proof which will make it easier to tell the story in a museum. Many believe that the answers to many of the country's questions lie within the wreckage of that illegal slave ship that brought the Bambara people to our shores. If you don't have an understanding of your past, you don't know how you're going to be moved into the, move into the future. Um, that is one of the things I find lacking in the Turks and Caicos Islands. And as a result of that, I think we have challenges in determining or trying to find out who we are as Turks Islanders. What's our true identity? Because of that lack of knowledge, because of that lack of research into our, our historical past, into our, our, our heritage. We did find a shipwreck site that um, was the closest match to what we uh, thought uh, Troubadour would look like. Uh, it wasn't at Breezy Point, but then the documents never said the shipwreck was at Breezy Point. They said the people were at Breezy Point. Uh, this one is at Black Rock, which is uh, about a kilometer and a half downwind from Breezy Point, not that big a, a distance. Uh, and so we've been calling it the Black Rock Wreck because the shipwreck there didn't have uh, a sign on it that said Troubadour, which we never expected. That's not ever the way it works out. And also we know that the, uh, the wreck uh, carried over the reef and wrecked in the lagoon, which is where this, this uh, Black Rock wreck is. And we know that uh, the Troubadour was salvaged uh, and people here in the islands were really good at salvage. They would take all the, the fasteners, not just the cargo, but all the fasteners and, and uh, you know, anything that could be reused on land to build a house or, or do anything else. So 
it, uh, we didn't expect to find a lot of artifacts on it. It isn't like a, a ship that sinks in 100 feet and everything's there. Everything that was on it originally is still there. Uh, so uh, we had to piece together the identity from the location and the things that were present, including the, the hull of the ship, and the things that were absent. Uh, uh, the absence of something is often as telling as the presence of something. I think it would be a wonderful boom for us, tourism-wise, to use that story, because it's a very positive story about slavery and all its bad, you know, um, press has gotten for years because this is really a story that has a wonderful happy ending. They were on their way to Cuba to become slaves, to be sold off. Um, they happened to, to wreck here and because we were um, a freed uh, slave nation uh, mm -hmm. under, under British, they were given the freedom and they became free men and women in this country and now they had left their, their own hometown. But, um, and then I think that we don't know how many of them also went to Haiti they had a very strong African connection. They would probably felt even better there. But um, it's, a, it's important that we, we, we race the ship, we get um, evidence, um, that we build a museum or we build a monument um, to the slaves, um, to the persons involved um, with the ship, and also have that wonderful ship, um, I guess, uh, rebuilt or some kind of replica of it. They had a wonderful story called Amistad, and that story is, uh, is not as big as this story. So, and that went very far. So I think we have a big potential to really affect um, the world um, globally with our story. Local artisans use African art and crafts as cultural indicators, particularly on North and Middle Caicos. Bush medicine practitioners and straw weavers practice their skill in modern times which suggests that the residents of these islands are more directly related to the first generation of Africans. A very special member of the Middle Caicos community is Mr. Alton Higgs, a renowned straw worker and medicine man. The culture have to be lived. You have to live your culture. You know? Now when I go, okay, I go to business, it is and that and that. I always got something to remember, look on me on culture. I don't go before culture, got culture. You understand that? You cannot accept somebody else culture, other land culture. Mine, you get things from other land to help you, yeah. It's really good. But it's, it's, it's impossible for you to take our other land culture and bring it into Tucks and Kickers Island and say, use that, say, this Tucks and Kickers Island culture. No! That can't work. It, and that's why they're trying to bring back friendly culture to bring it here. No! You got to preserve Tucks and Kickers Island culture. You must remember that culture is fluid, the nature of culture is change. However, our identity as a people is really based in our culture and heritage. So if we change too much, then we lose connection to our identity. You lose that, and then there's, a, uh, there's, there's no fabric to, uh, to bind us together. And so we've got to be careful of what we throw out, what we bring in. So the young kids today have their own culture. It's a very hip-hop generation. It's uh, really about American culture and other Caribbean culture. And we look at our own culture as something that the old folks did. However, when you start looking at your grandparents and your elders and where they come from, and we are here because of them, out of respect, one should also be mindful that who they were as people and how they lived is a part of who we are now. Like throughout the Turks and Caicos Islands, but more so in Middle Caicos, um, there, 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 there are three things I, I can actually point at. Um, um, number one has to do with the, the, the way we celebrate our, our, our festive occasions, particularly Christmas. Um, that, that was a slave, uh, slave's way. That was the way for slaves to enjoy themselves, not only in the 
Turks and Caicos, but also in the Caribbean. The, the, the second thing has to do with um, uh, our, our culture, the way we cook some of the food we eat, how we prepare our foods, uh, there, there are similarities. And when we look at our, our dance and, um, um, and, and, and so forth. So those are three critical areas that, uh, that we can actually trace back uh, to, to West Africa where it is believed that that strong link has been established between Middle Caicos and West, particularly Bambara, uh, Middle Caicos and West Africa. We do have an African connection, but unlike other Caribbean islands that had huge numbers of slaves from Africa, where you can see a distinct retention of African heritage through their, even their speech, um, some of their dance and some of their drumming. But here, it was very diluted, except for the um, the slaves who came with the troubadour, we're not quite sure how much of that has retained, but we do have the um, hair plaiting, the basket weaving, we have the bush medicine, we have the drumming and the ripsaw music, we have the folk songs, um, and the storytelling. And it's hard to trace exactly what came directly from Africa or what came to the United States, but we all know that it has an African connection to the slaves who lived here during that time. Na 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 Bambara The name Bambara has become synonymous with rum here at the Turks and Caicos Islands. The wine cellar has created a complete product line that is not only popular here in the Turks and Caicos, but in the region and indeed around the world. And the principal purveyors of this liquid libation is Fotak on Grace Bay. This thing is so sweet, nothing can compare. Boy, you better give me my share. Bambara sows me about, lick me in my mouth, make my woman scream and shout. Coconut, white, hard It would be interesting to find out what Bambara means to the average Turks and Caicos Islander. Let's hit the streets. Bambara on the beach one day. Bambara is the first place to go to the Turks and it's the lowest one on the market. Better than Hennessy. Better than Hennessy. Better than, better than New Gregos. It's a rock. It's a rock all over. When you drink a bottle of Bambara, you get a nice smooth. And the ladies, the ladies would be the Oh, you got it. Come, come, come. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bambara, I, I will. I don't think I'm being. I can throw up in here. But get you on that. I say you have a home mark. Bambara's TCI is Bass Cap Secret. And that's my hometown. And they call me Mr. Bambara. Well, when I hear the word Bambara, the first thing that comes to mind is sin. Sweet sin. Bambara, party. Time to, time to drink up. Like I tell you, I have a bar policy all for his timeless. Have to have a shot of Bambara on you. When I think of Bambara, I think of the Texas and Caicos history because Bambara is a part of one of the oldest history talked about in the island. The word Bambara, I, I hear music. Mm. I hear drums. I hear beat. <laughs> <laughs> Smooth and uh, really nice. And I think of Jesus and Bambara specials at the local bars. Um, and a uh, good time. Make my woman scream and shout. Coconut, white, or gold. Reserve a sweet, just so drink it if you're young or old. One early morning, walking by Mara Beach. This bottle flowed right up to me. I take one look and guess what I see? It then right in this little country. I can't find Gilly sitting by your store. I tell them better than The people of Bambara live a simple yet rewarding life in their own little world where relationships with neighbor and God are center and working with your hands is a privilege. It is here that the Turks and Caicos Islands culture remains alive in all its manifestations. The settlement of Bambara bore the name Bambara and that only happened after um, the, the um, wreck of the Troubadour and those persons came to shore. The freed slaves who lived in the Middle Caicos, they just, they didn't spend the entire time in Middle Caicos. There was a system operated back then where 
um, the planters in the Caicos Islands would um, allow their servants that they became the free the slaves became servants after the emancipation so they allowed their servants to go to Grand Turk to work in the soil pans for the proprietors over there and sometimes when it wasn't um, harvesting of the soils in the Turks Islands I believe some of those um, servants came to the Caicos Islands so it was like a system they they operated. For me personally um, Bambara means Middle Caicos and that's where my folks are from. My grandmother and my mother were both born in Laramus in Middle Caicos. So Bambara as a kid was another village, another settlement in Middle Caicos. Bambara is home for me. My, my parents were, uh, my mother grew up in Bambara. My, my both my, on, on both family sides, my father's side and my mother's side. Um, that is where my, my four parents originated from, right? So it, 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 there are a number of, there are a lot of sentiments attached to, to, to Bambara. The word Bambara means survivors. It means history. And those two words are connected because the survivors from the Troubadour were able to set such a precedence that a settlement is actually named after the experience that they had. Bambara Rum was created to pay homage to the ancestral beginnings of the Turks and Caicos Islands. There are only a handful of us in the Turks and Caicos Islands that know of our connection to the tribal men and women of West Africa that spoke the Bambara language. Uh, Bambara Rum is simply a means of getting people to start asking questions. You know, question its name, question its authenticity, question its historical relevance. Uh, through these questions, a truth will emerge and we'll finally have a better understanding of where we came from. And of course, the award-winning taste of Bombay rum doesn't hurt either. To find our ancestral beginnings, we had to go on a journey. This journey led us to the discovery of the slave ship Troubadour and the relationship between that ship and the Bambara settlement in Middle Caicos. The slave ship Troubadour is a story of two negative incidents, both which on their own would have generally led to tales of horror and sadness. The first was the capture and transportation of groups of Africans into slavery, a horrific journey across the Atlantic, with the slave markets waiting with unimaginable horrors that work in the sugar plantation would bring. The second is the wrecking of a ship, often the tale of loss of life and the terrors as the ship succumbs and sinks below the waves. However, in these instances, the two negatives mix to become a positive. The wrecking of the ship was to be the saving of 192 Africans bound for Cuban slave markets. The fortuitous wrecking deposited the human cargo on the shores of East Caicos and Turks and Caicos that had emancipated its slaves in 1834 seven years prior to the wrecking of the Troubadour. The local population embraced these slaves because they would provide cheap labor for the hard work on the salt ponds of Grand Turk and Salt Key. Not much is known as to what happened to these freed slaves after the years of apprenticeship ended, but many believe that they were located to the Caicos Islands where the soil was rich and they were better able to live off the ground. This settlement of Bambara is the only settlement in all of the Turks and Caicos Islands with an authentic African name, which would lead one to believe that there's a direct link between this settlement and those freed African slaves. And while there are many questions remaining and yet unanswered until they are answered, we can revel in the fact that we have a direct link to these noble, hardworking people. Bambara means different things to so many people. To some, Bambara is a rum and other similar confections. To others, Bambara is home. And to a few more, and perhaps most notably, Bambara is a story of triumph over evil. The spirit of Bambara is evidence in how we face and overcome challenges, our optimism, and our desire for justice. We can see the spirit of Bambara in the way we laugh and recreate. The spirit of Bambara lives, moves, and breathes in you. It lives, moves, and breathes in me. It lives, moves, and breathes in our children. It advises on the building blocks of our country and stands as a testament 
that the Turks and Caicos Islands is a nation of overcomers. It's flattering to see the attempts of local entrepreneurs to share the spirit of Pambara with the world one liter at a time. The varied blends and assorted flavors arouse the jumbi in every connoisseur and may inspire festive expressions, singing, dance, laughter. Do not be ashamed of your culture and to be ashamed to be a Turks and Caicos Islander. You understand that? Always you uh, go out, you can acknowledge, I am a Turks and Caicos Islander. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of that.